Well, hey guys, thank you all so much again for coming out. Again, for those of you who are new, my name is Stephen Pennington. I am running for Bear County Tax Assessor Collector. I um, also just want to, before we get started, want to give huge kudos and a huge thank you and appreciation uh, to Erin and her husband, the Eatons, and to Ole Miss Perk. They are amazing. They are amazing. They are so gracious for allowing us to use their space for a town hall and uh, hopefully y'all got um, some great, uh, I think, what, however we kind of term it as, sips and sweets, sweets and sips, is that There we go, sips and sweets, very well. So, uh, I discovered this place a while back and Aaron's amazing, so anyway, so that being said, um, thank you again for coming out. I'm running for Bear County Tax Assessor Collector because I believe in a fair, smart, and transparent tax system. I believe that the tax assessor collector should be an advocate for Bear County, for taxpayers and citizens of Bear County, um, but not to just focus on property taxes in, in particular, but I really wanted to see what could the office be done, you know, what could be done with the office to make it smart as well. When I say smart, I'm talking about simple things and practical things, like making an online system where you don't have to go to one of three substations, wasting, you know, tons of time. I, don't, I have my um, own personal anecdotes that I've described to many of you and that are available even on the Facebook page now uh, in the form of live video. But um, I re really wanted to use this opportunity, use this time to kind of field questions from uh, the community leaders who have shown up. We have a hodgepodge of people here, not only supporters, but you know, people from the community, people who found us uh, just on you know, Facebook who are interested in the issue. And, and I think it's very important that you know, they ask me the tough questions. I can kind of you know, field those answers. That way you can, you can understand that I'm a serious candidate. Uh, recently endorsed by San Antonio Express News, very, very, very appreciative of that endorsement, and I think it's um, uh, very telling. Uh, we were it's the only endorsement that they actually made one in each primary, and uh, so we'll, we'll read into that what we will. But um, I, I think kind of what they were able to say, and the fact that I was bringing a fresh voice, and I think that's exactly what the office needs. It's a, it's a fresh new perspective. Um, not a lot has gone on in the past eight years, and so I, I've jokingly said, but in all seriousness, you know, if if the tax assessor elected office, you know, decides tomorrow that they're going to implement all the kind of changes and ideas that you know we're trying to imp that I'm proposing that we implement, I'll drop out of the race. But the thing is, I can say that with confidence because they've had eight years to do it. It's not going to happen. Um, and so we do have Miss uh, Cynthia Spillman here today as well. Uh, she is the co-founder, and I'm going to let her give her, like her title that. as well, um, of Tier 1. Um, also my former uh, English high, sc high school English teacher, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just funny how, how the world, you know, how worlds kind of re-collide, but uh, Cynthia, thank you so much for being here. She's going to be hosting this community conversation today. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, ma'am. Thank you. No, I remember him when he was a skinny, goofy kid, always late to English class. And he was, the kids turned out good, hasn't Hey, no, hey now, hey now. Why was I late? Why was I late? I was making announcements. Thank he you. Said, he said. I had to make announcements. He was uh, already in front of a microphone even at a young age. My name is Cynthia Merlis Spielman, and I am co-founder of an organization called Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition with several other people, one of which, Cosmo Colvin, is here today with us. It's a coalition of over 60 neighborhoods plus organizations. We're now expanding um, in a coalition of all San Antonio neighborhoods, suburban and inner city alike, because we realize there are a lot of issues that we have in common, a lot of concerns. Those are nonpartisan, non -ge you know, not based on geography, but, but our neighborhoods and our concern for those neighborhoods. Many neighborhood, and these are, are my thoughts, um, not representative of anybody, but they are informed by the work I do and by the people I speak to, uh, both in the inner city and the suburbs. Many neighborhood advocates work on issues of displacement and affordability in our inner city neighborhoods. We understand that the more intense and dense development has created a speculative land frenzy, driving up land values. In this case, it's not our homes the developers want, it's our land. <coughs> Demolishing a home and replacing it with six tall market rate structures is very lucrative. In my neighborhood, a replatted lot that sold for $35,000 several years ago was sold for $200,000 and just recently went on the market for $250,000. Nothing's been done to this lot, it is sat empty. We are besieged with notices, signs, calls, letters offering to buy our homes. Flippers often, without pulling permits or cutting corners, slapping a granite counter, a coat of paint, some shellac on the floors in these homes, for, and then selling them for three times of what they paid. 
Well, you might say, you should be happier sitting on a gold mine. But my neighbor Danny, who was born in his home, says, people tell me this is an investment, but it's not an investment to me. This is my home. Where am I going to go? Danny is paying for his own displacement because the elephant in the room is our property taxes. My neighbor Kay, a renter, is vulnerable as her landlord raises her rents because he cannot pay his property taxes unless he does so. She'll not find any other affordable units nearby. This is not an anti-development screed. Although there can be some bad actors, developers and investment companies are simply businesses. It is the way that we're taxed is one of the major issues. One of my fellow advocates once said we have a permanent tenant-landlord tenant relationship with the government. And that landlord is harsh. We buy a home we can afford, and, vote, and through no fault of our own, often because of the result of city development policies, our homes become a burden that we find hard to bear. And with the raising SAWS rates, insurance, transportation costs, it's no wonder that many people are forced to sell. We're living in a society in which people are literally being taxed out of their homes. We're living in a society in which our children, many of whom are already burdened by education loans, have little hope of owning a home, creating a permanent social structure of haves and have-nots. Um, we are worsening the economic segregation in the city that limits future possibilities of generations to come. And I feel this is a moral crisis. And to make it worse, that tax burden is not equally shared. In fact, the poorer the resident, the more extreme the consequences. Commercial properties who do not pay their fair share, wealthy homeowners who do not disclose selling prices, avoiding the taxes that rest of us pay, tax rebates and breaks for market rate developments, we carry the burden for them. And frankly, I'm sick of it. We live in a city that's growing. We want jobs and opportunities for our children and grandchildren. We need good schools transportation choices for the future, clean water, and other public services that allow our city to not only exist, but to thrive. I am not an anti-tax person. I am happy to pay my taxes for a city that's a good place to live, but homeowners and small landlords cannot carry that burden alone. Token tax breaks that do more harm than good, but allow politicians to appear sympathetic to their constituencies are a joke. I want a well-funded city in which we are not forced to choose between water and transportation and early childhood education. But I want that burden to be lessened by all paying their fair share. And this will take political will, which can only come from a concerted effort on the part of citizens for meaningful change. This will take pressure, this takes pressure on our state legislature and government. And I'm talking serious, nonpartisan, long-term work to change the property tax rules in this state. We have been divided and manipulated, and we squabble and fight, and guess who wins? Not us. We have been played like, by politics like those little plastic rock and sock em games where the little plastic boxers manipulated by invisible hands beat the snot out of each other. I'm done with that, and I hope many of you are too. Very, very appreciative um, of that um, monologue, shall we? <laughs> Monologue, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Big mouth woman, just <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. But there's a few things that I think you had kind of touched on there, and I'm going to kind of work my way backward. She was talking about political will. I mean, obviously, folks, this is a, a big office that we're going for, and um, I'm a young guy with nothing to lose, and that's to your benefit. The thing is, I'm running, you know, I talked to a ton of people, and they said, you know, why are you running for the office that everybody, you know, the that everyone wants to hate. You want to be the guy that everybody wants to hate. Well, my, my whole thing is, many of us understand, and I'll give you an education now, that the tax assessor collector is actually not the entity that taxes, that assesses the tax on your property. It's actually just someone that collects it. Uh, but by, what, what I'm saying is I'm advocating for the appraisal district, which is the actual appraisal body, the one that assesses the, the land valuation and the, the home valuation, I'm saying that we have to go to the legislature. The tax assessor collector needs to be an advocate for citizens, to be a fiduciary for citizens, to where they can have an actual duty to the people who they're serving, the people who, they, who elected them. Because the appraisal district doesn't have an elected body. There's no one that elects the appraisal district. There's no one that, you know, they, that they really answer to except for the county. You know, for, you know they've got that three-day kind of notice policy. But what, I, what I'm saying is the tax assessor collector in concert with all the rest of the 253 tax assessor collectors across the state of Texas, we can go to the legislature and we can say, hey, this is not just an issue in my county. 
It's a common trend across all counties, Republican or Democrat, to be quite frank. And it's an unsustainable issue. It's an, it's an unsustainable trend that, that we, we, can't, uh, we, we can't maintain. I'm going to rewind just a little bit here. I kind of like how you said it. You, you were, well, and maybe, maybe you'll say, I just like the way you said it. You were saying it's not, uh, it cycles the economic future. What, what was that line? Um, uh, it, so, I mean, the, the problem is, is we've got children, and it might be you as well, that, that are burdened already by um, student loans. I mean, my children suffer from that. And, you know, couple that with the recession, we are looking at a future that they won't be able to own homes. And it's kind. It's we're starting to um, the idea of the have and have nots, a permanent class of tenants and landlords, and the landlords being fewer and the tenants being most people that can't afford homes. Well, an anecdote to that is, and many of you I've shared this with before, but my own personal property taxes in tax year seventeen to eighteen went up forty nine point six percent. It's it's not sustainable, <laughs> and, and and there's no there's no under no jurisdiction under no premise, can you possibly justify a 50% increase in one year? There's just literally no way, to, there's no way to justify that. And so any, any way you look at it, it's not sustainable. And so I'm running to go, you know, I'm putting everything that, you know, I'm doing on the line to go, let's make this right. We can make this right. There, there are different strategies. I was talking to Mr. Bernard, who's here today, um, he found us on Facebook, and we you know, were talking about, you know, cap, you know, putting certain caps on it, you know, once you decide you want to do do Airbnb and then you have to pay market rate. There's different strategies that we can talk about, but my, my thing is it just needs to be right. It just needs to feel right. It needs, it, needs to, it needs to feel fair. I think everyone can agree that the current system is not fair. So how many of you have ever protested or have had that problem where your taxes have gone up? How many of you who own home that you've actually seen your taxes go up? How many of you have been down to protest? Yeah, I think we're dealing with an even more informed group. And so, I mean, for the camera, a lot, you know, more, probably about half the room raised their hand for the protest part. Um, and, and to that point, I, I think that's kind of ridiculous that, that the burden is on the taxpayer to fight for what the county is telling you to do. You know, I, I do federal taxes. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, especially we do about, we're up to about 50 returns a day from January, from the second week of January all the way through April 15th. We'll do, you know, 50 to 80 returns a day. And, you know, the federal government has this right. One of the things that they do have right is you, we file our taxes every year, and if they think that you're wrong, that's when the burden is on you. The burden is on, is on them. And then, and then when they think you're wrong, that's when they issue you out a letter. Well, on the county level, we say, here's your tax bill. If you think we're wrong, prove that we're wrong. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a backward system, and, and that's what I'm hoping to force to change with a small mechano uh, mechanism and using economics to just go, if we make that appeals process easier, more people will do it. More, and then the overload that the appraisal district will experience will literally force them to reevaluate the way that they even that, you know do valuations for homes. Um, but with that, um, I, again, I, I don't want to make this a huge pro you know property tax thing. We we do want to talk about property taxes. That is one thing that we are able to talk about. But uh, I want to really take your questions about if you have questions about the tax assessor collector's office, questions about the specifics of what we're going to do. Yes, ma'am, Imelda. Hi. Thanks for being here today. Yes. I have a question. You mentioned earlier about the increase, the high increase, almost half of the, of the percentage in a year's time span. Yeah. What is the cause of that? What could be the cause of that? If you ask the appraisal. What are some of the reasons behind that? Yeah, that particular piece of land is uh, about five minutes this way, 78216-133 uh, Ali Bay Drive, uh, right on the back end of Olmos Park uh, walking trails. Um, and if you ask the appraisal district, uh, they'll say, you know, land values in that area went up and, you know, demand exceeds supply. And my response to that is, I don't care. <laughs> There's literally, I, you, could, you could say that all day and it sounds great. There's nothing that could justify it. Though. So, I mean, so that's what the, the answer to your question, because uh, I call, I call and ask. Um, and then uh, really quick, I'm going to segue just a little bit back to your point. Uh, Cynthia was explaining how it's the poorer that 
actually, it, there are, are effective and it, it hurts the most. Um, and if we actually, if you could call the appraisal district right now, we did because we were generating and uh, developing a, a white paper on this. But precinct, if you specifically look at precinct one and two, these are the precincts that are experiencing the hardest brunt of this valuation increase. And the tax assessor collector right now gets to throw up his hands and go, not my problem. And he's right, it's not his problem. But I'm running to make it my problem. You can do something with the bully pulpit that, that is that office, and that's just not happening right now. Uh, but, I, but I'm also saying, uh, just to give you a small anecdote, we've got about six people lined up to pro, pro, profile right now. These are people who are quite literally being taxed out of their homes. Think about, they've paid off their homes that they bought you know, 15, 20 years ago now, and now it's 2020, and they're living on fixed income of $24,000 to $30,000 a year, and their tax bill is $5,000. So we're, we're looking, exactly, we're looking at 20 to 30% of their entire annual income just being eaten up by the tax. I really like the way that the, your colleague said it. It's a, it's a permanent tenant-landlord relationship with the government, and it's ridiculous. Yes. And, you know, people like my neighbor Danny is shutting off his air conditioner. He's got, you know, window units. He goes without air conditioning in the summer because he can yeah. he's trying to save money for his tax bill. He's now working two jobs, one of them in Houston, yeah. back and forth on the bus. And this isn't to better his life. It's not to buy anything. It is to simply pay his taxes. Just to pay the taxes on a home that he has already paid for. Yeah, the... And this sentiment, yeah, yeah, this sentiment we've heard so many times where, I, you know, we're not going to do, you know, that that's really drastic, probably not even um, it's uncommon. It's not unusual. Yeah, not unusual it's or uncommon, not. but I've heard, you know, yeah, we don't do cable anymore because we're, we're, we have to make, make that cut to be able to afford the taxes. Javier, you have um, a question? Yeah, uh, so I guess what my thing is, and I might be wrong in my thinking here, but you said you want to put in some type of you know engineering mechanism that's going to uh, make property values not be assessed so high, right? So what happens when you do when you do that, and all these homeowners who bought at these inflated prices are now upside down because let's say they bought a two hundred thousand dollar home and for some reason now property is getting assessed at one thirty, you know now that person's property is assessed at one thirty but you paid two hundred for it so now you're putting people upside down so how do you come back? I, I, like I said, correct me if I'm wrong. This is just, uh, I guess, a point that I thought. About. So, so you're saying the the market value of the home? Yeah, yeah, because then every other home is going to reset, right? And all the other homes are going to start starting to get assessed. All the homes for sale. I appreciate your faith in me to be able to do it that quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I said that. That's yeah, why I, said, yeah. I don't know if the thinking is. Yeah, flawed, no, but... I don't, and I wouldn't say that your thinking is flawed. I would say. If that occurs, it would happen over a greater period of time. Mm -hmm. We're still dealing with government here, folks, and uh, <laughs> nothing happens yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. overnight. But no, no, but but not not to discount your, this that particular sentiment. But I, I do believe, um, though you know, my anecdote is not a a fair one, you know, to yeah. use it as an example. But that 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 should be uncommon. But even somebody who's in their fifteenth year, yeah, uh, of their thirty-year note. You know, they bought at this inflated price. Let's say it took 15 years to do this. Right. But now their house hasn't appreciated at all, really, because houses are getting but, assessed differently. We don't, we don't figure, I'm a realtor, we don't look at tax values to, to figure the market value. Of no, house. no, I know comparables. I, I understand that. But right. the banks, when they lend on, when they, when banks they don't look on at the tax value either. They look at the appraised value. An appraisal they from an appraiser, not from the tax value. So, oh, and that's an education and, and that's, for all of us, so that, I guess. Well, okay, yeah, so I, I do real estate investing, and if I buy in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, banks land on the taxes. Yeah, not so, here. Uh, not okay. 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 And I guess, I mean, I guess kind of like, just from a, a, a finance and technical standpoint, I would say, looks like it's time to refinance. Yeah, right. right. But, uh, I mean, but that's, that's kind of, I would, I would probably venture to say outside of kind of the realm of this. My, my job as a tax assessor, a collector, is to do right by the citizen and the taxpayer, and if I can make your taxes lower, then I've done my job. Okay. Does it, does yeah, no, not, no, sure. not to skirt the question. No, no, you're good. But yeah. Yes, ma'am. You brought up a very valid point about you're the tax assessor collector. Yeah. You collect the taxes. You don't you know, put the amount on the taxes. So my question is, um, what things will you do to change the tax office? 
Yeah, so one, one, of the, one of the first things, so I want a fair, smart, and transparent. So when it comes to changing it, I'd like to focus kind of on the center one, the smart, because I believe it, it affects the other two. So when I say smart office, um, an, an anecdote that I've shared with many people is the fact that um, I tried to get a transaction done with the tax assessor's collector office. It took me about uh, six trips there and wasted a grand total of, if I really had to, no, no exaggeration at all, probably about eight hours, an entire you know, day, an entire eight hours you know, driving and so forth and so on. First time I went, uh, I went to the Nacogdoches office and said, oh, we don't handle that transaction here, you've got to go downtown. Went downtown, they said, oh, you didn't have this signature. Went back to go get the signature, went back down, oh, well, now there's this other form where you need to get this signature from. Well, no, okay, well now you've got to go get it re-inspected over here for this. All this foolishness where had I been able to go online, I'd have been able to just get kind of a list together, prepare all my documents and take it in and go. And, and really, every other business operates like that. I hate when, uh, and somebody even kind of, we were talking about it earlier, and they, they said customer. Um, and that's one of my pet peeves. I don't believe that, I do not believe governments have customers. Governments have citizens, okay? I, I could show you on my phone right now a screenshot. I have three of them. Every time I call the county office, um, it rings for about 40 minutes. 40 with, with no exact, try tomorrow on your, you know, or uh, well, not tomorrow, but Sunday. <laughs> try Monday. In, in all seriousness, you'll see that it just kind of keeps ringing, kind of keeps ringing, kind of keeps ringing. If I was a customer, okay, I would have hung up probably 90 seconds in and yeah. called, if it was a bank, I would just call another bank at that point. We're not able to do that. So it's it's less about customer service and it's about, and it sounds like semantics. It really does. That's a Cynthia yeah. Stillman word. Semantics. <laughs> he was listening. I was, I was. But it, but it's not. It, it's about citizen service because when you when you view the people that you're serving as citizens, then you treat them as such. You treat you, there. It's your duty to serve these people. You have an obligation to them. It's the, it's the highest order. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? I mean, well, I mean, I mean to I guess expound on it. Um, making a lot of things online. I posted a, a live video. There was a gentleman in front of me. I was at the Bandera substation, and he got he got a ticket. And they said, oh, sir, um, you're in the wrong place. You've got you've to take it downtown. And because that had happened to me about two trips prior, I was like, man, I, you know, I, I said, let me just you know, talk to this guy. Turns out this guy's from out of, not even out of town. He's out of state. He's oh. coming from like North Dakota or something like that, trying to transact on, the, on behalf of his mother. Oh. And it was his third attempt. And so had that information been online, he could have saved yeah. a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, and then just to kind of end up that note, when I was finally able to get my transaction completed, uh, yes, it took an hour, and that's its own topic of conversation. But, uh, and I was sharing this with Javier, you know, you fill out that document, and then you hand it over to the clerk. And what does the clerk do? They just type it in an in a online form. <laughs> they type in an online form. You, you know, you stand there while they type in an online form. What am I saying with that? That could have been done at home. It's so manual. All the processes. I know there's long lines, tedious lines. Long, tedious lines. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. As far as um, uh, people that raise their hand for if they went to you know, protest or taxes, protest or taxes were were all successful. Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's a, thank you. That, let's take that poll. So for the ones who went to protest their taxes, out of those, how many were successful? Actually, so let's do, let's do the initial, how many would you go protest? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then how many were successful? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, and what is success? If they lowered it. Was it a, wasn't it a, did, okay, let me ask you this. Let's get a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like it was fair after you protested? Did you feel like you were at a fair evaluation? Or did the county just get, give you a little bit of a kickback to get you out of their face? So for the first time, uh, we thought it was fair because they didn't tax us for about five, six years. Okay. Oh, okay. We stayed at the same deal. Uh huh. We so gave you an example, 63000 Yeah. Next thing we do, after five years, 118000 Okay. Okay, after five, six years, we had been taxed annually, so I said, oh, I'm going to tax. They said, oh, wow. Okay. Went in challenge. 
they adopted to 109. Got it. So, well, and can, can, I, can I speak to that? I've got a stat to make everybody real mad. Uh -oh. You know, ready for it? Uh, so it's called, in, in business, we call it margin. I don't know what they call it in, uh, in, in government fraud. I don't know. But it's, <laughs> there was a study done back in 2017 that demonstrated that valuations are overinflated at the tune of about 18%. So even when you do go protest your taxes and you get, you know, a 10%, you know, kickback and you're in your area, well, the Delta is still 8% overvalued. And uh, like I said, in business, we call it margin. I, I don't know what you call it when it's government. And yes, right after that, like years later, they kept on going, like you said. Kept on going up. 40 yep. up. Year over year, 30%, 40%. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. 2016, let's say I was 163. Yeah. 2019, 49. Oh, the, the, wow. Yeah. Is there anyone? Do do you all have a homestead? Does everybody have a homestead yes. exemption? Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I appreciate you bringing up that point. I saw your hand. I do want to, again, talking about it all goes back to SMART, which I believe yes. affects fair and transparent. Okay. But to the home, to all the exemptions, really, okay? The county smart folks, okay, and, and the county's got a lot going on, but, but the county got, has a lot of information as well. And I would ascertain that the county has enough information to make your homestead automatic, which I believe it should be. Well, I believe yes and no. Yeah. Because being in the business, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, we have to make sure that when people buy that house that they are going to be living in that house. Yes. The county doesn't really have a way of knowing that somebody's living in that house yeah. unless they are Pardon me? Yeah, other than mailing address, they don't. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, and I just sent out notices to my people who bought houses last year with Take the form and yeah. filled in what I you know, could, needed to fill in for them uh, to make sure they're filing that exemption. But, yeah, maybe just like voting could be automatically registered when you get your driver's license. And that's all I'm saying. But, this, but it is a little more complicated than house buying because... There are people who buy a lot of houses. Okay. Some, I, bet, I bet the county buy. knows how old you are, though. Yeah, they well, know. they probably do. They and the county buy. can know how much you pay for your house. Unfortunately, uh, it, as I mean, we're, we are a non-disclosure state, of course. but they do have people who work in the county that are realtors, and they do have access to that because when you go in to protest, you can see that they have our reports there. And so they, they can do that, but you also can. And, and to your point, what I, what I, when, I, when I say automatic, what I'm, what I'm getting at is it should be simplified. Okay? So when I, when I say, for, for example, a check of a box, are you, gonna be, are you living in this home? You well, know, but it's are, a simple form that you fill out one time only. It really is not that difficult to form. And you only fill it out one time. Then why don't, it's there for Why don't more people do it? I don't, because they don't. No, you cannot do it until the January after you've lived in the house. So if you buy your house in May, October, whatever month, you cannot fill that out until January. So that's the part that ought to be changed. You should be able to get that form and fill it out at the t at closing. You should be able to fill it out. Same, so, so same that, with the senior the citizen and same with you know disability and veterans exemptions. I, you know, I, I really do feel like those can't be automatic, but again, the point is to simplify that process. And again, when you take the approach of being an advocate and what's the second one, a fiduciary to taxpayers and citizens, you go, okay, how can I inform them and make them aware of these simple forms, you know, and, and mail them out or, you know, shoot, you know, get, gather the email, get, shoot them an email so they can be aware of this, put out a PSA, the comptroller has PSAs all over, you know, the, the billboards right now. The county can do the same thing. Yeah, unfortunately, what I've found, though, is that they don't even have the new owners on the BCAD records. We have it on a, a different record, but they some of them are not even on the BCAD record until after January. Yeah, it takes a long time for them. For a little while. So, so, but, again, the simple way would be for it to happen at closing. At closing, closing the, the closer tells them you do this, and I always say, and I'm going to tell you in January. Well, you're hired. I'm not going to remember hired. until January. Hired so. once I get an office. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to speak first quickly to Lynn's point. Also in the business, so have plenty of experience. But 
I, I'm going to disagree and side with you in the sense that neither system is perfect. So some there's going to be exceptions to the rule on either side. And Cynthia knows this as neighborhoods we fight this where it's always our burden. I would, and, and so this is what I would say, flip it to the other side. The yes, there will things Absolutely. that will fall through the crack. People will take advantage. They always do. But still a flipping of the burden. Absolutely. And so I would agree. I think her compromise is also good. And again, as Cynthia and I have learned, sometimes you have to incrementally step into things. Yeah, and course. so a compromise <laughs> position or, or something that helps that maybe doesn't take it all the way to here is Actually, very we, we've, got, we've got to plant a stake. As to set a goal, but yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And it helps bring people along when you don't just go from here all the way to the other side or set up it. It's either this or it's a that. You know, that's, that's problematic. Yeah, fair point. Good My question. question to you is, when you talk about fairness, yeah. so give me an example of what you would do to advocate for something to, for it to be more fair. So, my, I guess it's more of a sentiment. I, it's like so. For example, I think we can all agree that my property taxes going up down the street here, fifty percent in one year, doesn't make sense and is in no way fair. Okay, so so I, I, there again, if everybody is going up that, where is the unfairness? I play a little bit devil's advocate. Now I agree, it causes a burden that causes some other problems. But my, I guess my bigger point would be so if assessing values based on the comparables, as the market is rising and things are selling for more, makes the system unfair, how would you assess that? We have that? to change the system. So how would yeah. you, what, so what the, is your my, idea? My fa the favorite one that I've kind of hodgepodge put together with a lot of due diligence that I've done is doing it at, essentially being, being it at the transfer, meaning you tax on the sale or the purchase price, and then it does, and that essentially locks in your valuation until it's transferred to another individual. You can either take market rate at that point or the sell of the home, whichever is higher. That's like Prop 13 in California, though. Well, they do it in California. They're except not, they allow for a two percent per annum. Oh, yeah, for every, every, every year. Yeah, yeah. That. It's maxed, and and that has been very beneficial. From a cost savings standpoint, there are those that would argue that it has hurt the state from a revenue standpoint. So. Well, well, here, well, here's the thing. Again, my duty is to the taxpayer and citizen. But the other item, and this, this is now this is completely outside of the jurisdiction, but people on the uh, on uh, how should I put this on the extreme end would completely do away with property taxes and have a flat. 13% consumption tax. Um, I don't know if that's palatable to, uh, to Texas citizens. Um, I, to be completely honest, when I, when I look at that, um, I, I mean, I feel like when I travel to other states, you know, I, I kind of realize, and many of our military members will be able to understand as well, you know, you go to Pennsylvania, we're looking at 6%, you're like, oh, wow, you know, that 2% break, you know, is nice. Um, you know, 8.25% is the, the tax regime I was born and raised under, and then you know, you go somewhere else, and you're like, oh, okay, 5% sales tax is not bad. Of course, they're making up for it in income tax, so forth and so on. What I'm getting at is, I think there's a balance, but my duties to the taxpayer and citizen, um, we can do a better job. Okay, it's not, it's not my job to manage county spending. You know, that's commissioner's court. You know, obviously, the tax assessor collector does have its own set budget right now. It's at about $16 million. But what I'm getting at is, my duty is to the taxpayer and citizen. And if I could make one of other course. comment. So yeah. going back to fairness, what I think is incredibly unfair in the current system is that the commercial properties do not pay their fair share. Mm -hmm. And that has been an Get more specific with that. So that, big for, box for all stores, of our big the, box for all stores of our like Lowe's and, and so you're lots saying, of big stores. You're saying the exemptions and the rebates? First of no, all, they, no. they fight, they litigate. And so Bear County spends a ton of money fighting those litigations. And they all often win, and so their properties are lowered. And they have this dark store thing that they do. So they like that they, they will compare one store to another store where that store is dark, not operating, and use that as an argument for valuation. And 
as Lynn pointed out, we are a non-disclosure state. And that works really well with commercial properties because they're not sold through the multiple listing and service. They don't even disclose to one another. But the multiple listing service requires of its broker members that they post the sales price. So I, as a private citizen homeowner who puts in my contract that I want to exercise the non-disclosure agreement, I was told by my agent, I can't do that. No, no, no. Uh, we don't report that to the state. No, I'm not it's saying anything, MLS. but it's required by the MLS. And as you said earlier, there the county has access. Well, the, the county MLS. only has access to it because they hire, there are people at the county who are realtors and they, but they don't go in for all of that to, to get it. They just, I think, use Another it. Another way that it's um, um, unfair is unequal comparable. So you've got Rolling Oaks Mall, you've got the quarry using Rolling Oaks Mall as a comparable. And Rolling Oaks Mall is a much, um, it doesn't, you know, it's not nearly as crowded or it's as valuable as the quarry. You use JW so, Marriott, that's the big one. Because the JW Marriott is taxed the same as some of the smaller hotels. Yeah, that's, we're, we're that's, that's the problem. Yes, sir. It says that uh, they love the idea of online opportunities to to follow your information, but what about those who don't have access to the internet? How would we handle that? Yeah, absolutely. And I really love this question because I think it gets a little misinterpreted when I say, "Yeah, we're going to move everything online." We will have it when we move things online. That becomes an extra option. But what I really want to kind of focus on and highlight here is when things get moved online, those who want to do things online will do them online, and that actually frees up more time, right. more you know, more space in for the people who want to go to the substation <coughs> to transact. They're able to do that, and so and, and so they're by by function, their wait times get shorter. You know, they're they're able to be serviced faster. Um, and so I, I love that question. It's a, it's a great question, but it's not it, for those who don't want to be online. You don't have to be. And I think you know we can we can create simpler ways for you to transact. Uh, but if you want to go in the substation, go in the substation, and you will you will be benefited by everyone who else, everyone else is going online. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Anything been considered about? Um, I guess getting a poll, um, having citizens, homeowners vote if they want their taxes raised. Oh, that's a great that's a great one. So uh, this past session, House Bill Three and Senate Bill Two, um, we have what's called uh, there, there was a reduction of the rollback rate. Uh, we're going to get real technical real quick here, but long story short, is the county couldn't rate or and excuse me, the city we're not going to be able to raise your taxes past, um, it used to be 8%, now that's dropped to 3%. So if it, if it goes past 3%, then they've got to take it to the voters for a vote. Um, prior to that, essentially everyone's got to get the way scotch-free by, you know, by raising, you know, their particular tax, you know, for, you know if you look at it, 6 to, 6 to 7% year over year is what we were looking at. And uh, again, back to the, the fairness point, not fair. It, the, the state was right to do that, and uh, furthermore, to the state, that's who that's who we have to go. That's who we have to go to. And I want to be very, very clear. The reason why the tax assessor collector right now gets to go throw up his hands and go, "Not my problem," is because it's not. It's not technically his problem. But you can use that office. You can use that as office as a pulpit to essentially go to the state. Get, you know, coalesce with your other tax assessor collectors in major metro counties and go to the state because the state the 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 will the political will the will is there we we have a little bit of it there it's it was demonstrated in this past uh in this past session that they saw that it was getting out of control and voters were talking to their state representatives going hey this is an issue and so and so we we're starting to make a little bit of progress but I think we need. I, I think it's going to take the tax assessor collectors who have who are, who are the ears to the ground on the issue. Um, everybody already thinks that's where it happens, and so we, we might as well use that to uh, to advocate for the citizens at the state level. I am aware that Texas is, is Texas is one of the highest 
property tax states in America. Because we don't, we don't, we don't and because have we don't have an income tax. tax. So to be fair, the, the response, you know, the reason for that is because we don't, you know, we don't have an income tax. As a professional, uh, per, you know, tax advisor who does income tax every day, um, who sees <laughs> other state income tax, again. Me personally, I, I really don't know. I, 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 I like the way that, the, uh, I, I prefer the system being the way that it is um, than, than leveraging it over to a, an income tax. I think that it, I think that installs an, another level of um, complexity that, that we, we don't need. And, and we've been under this tax regime, you know, our, for our entire existence, if I'm not mistaken. I think, I think it would be... Uh, an, I looked at my cell phone bill and I stopped looking at all the taxes. Yeah. Going on. I hate all. What is, what is, um, whatever taxes it is. Right. I mean, I mean it's, it, it totals about 20, maybe 15, 20 dollars. Yeah. Which is probably about all the way up to 25, yeah, percent of your bill, if and I had to guess. I know they normally surcharge, they put tax on tobacco, alcohol, whatever, you know. And let me, so, so to, to, hone in on this point, if those were less or zeroed out, would you not feel that it was more fair or that it was a, a better system for you? Well, I don't smoke and I don't drink, but um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, 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 I know it's a lot of families who, you know, they can't afford the home. They right. don't live in their home anymore and it's because taxes is high um, and it's kind of, you know, being that um, I'm a homeowner, my house is in Harris County, in Houston, mm. and I'm living here, so I don't have my home city center anymore, but I do have one other exemption on my property. I say that to say, I know, and being in San Antonio, I've noticed that renting an apartment is just like my house, just like my mortgage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've noticed homes, they're building homes all around the San Antonio area and they're so small and they're valued they want a, they want two hundred, three hundred thousand for a home. And you don't have much yard at all. You don't you know I was just at an event with Cynthia um, where the, uh, the, the the city was talking about developers partnering <laughs> with neighborhood associations and, and how to kind of approach that and broach that you know, so that there's some, um, some parity, if you will. So, I mean, you know, part of what we're struggling with is, you know, you, you can be like this forever, right? And you stay that way. Or you can try to find common ground. You can try to listen, you know, I can play devil's advocate. Not that I'm, I'm advocating for a position because I haven't researched enough, but you could say, at least with income tax, you are you are putting a tax on people who actually use something, and it lessens the burden on people who 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 own property. For instance, if you are a dentist, an attorney, a doctor, and you have an office, you're you're leasing it. You're not paying any property taxes, and you're not paying income tax. And the problem is, is if everybody's not not fairly you know uh, participating in taxes, it's then. People like you and I and my neighbor Danny who has to carry that burden. That doesn't mean I'm advocating for an income tax, but it's. And so I think I think the thing I like about you, Stephen, is that you're part of that movement to try to find that common ground to help to help everyone. And and I think it takes a lot of discussions like this one. It takes a lot of exploring because that's not easy. We're too used to just doing this. That's easy. Hard, it's harder finding solutions. And I congratulate that you're trying to do so. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Do we have any other questions on the board? Yes, ma'am. If you were to be elected in the sense, we were speaking earlier, um, and it was mentioned, I think, by Cynthia, even her children that aren't home buyers yet at this time. Uh, if there's within the age gap, age gap of 30 and 40 year, old, 40 year olds that aren't home buyers at this time, or that are have to, having to leave their homes to move in with their parents because it's becoming too much of a high increase, how would you, if you were to be elected, help eliminate that stress for those homebuyers that are unable to do so because of the tax rates going up higher and higher? Um, I don't, so I don't, I don't, I, and I want to 
I would like to answer a question. I don't know if I exactly understand it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to answer it anyway. I don't know that we really could. I mean, I don't know when everyone when it, I know I, it's not. It wasn't for me when I buy a home when I was uh, ascertaining you know purchasing the property. Um, the taxes were not was not any at any consideration. It was just a purchase price. Um, you know, that's kind of like, you know, something that comes later, um, you know, or if you're getting like a, like a mortgage or whatever, I guess, you know, it's kind of factored in, um, but you know, it goes back to what she was mentioning earlier, yeah, like living in an apartment, it's the same price almost already. To well, the thing is, well, okay, to, to, thank you. Yeah. To that point, I mean, and, and actually back to what Cynthia was saying as well with the leasing, mm -hmm. oh, you absolutely pay <laughs> property taxes oh, in the form of, uh, and, 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 and the commercial, yeah, and, and commercial world, we call it triple nets, um, which I know all too well. Our nonprofit operates three locations. We know triple nets very well, and so you, and so when when they tell you to rent, that's really their profit is what they're getting at, because you're going to pay, you know, with common area maintenance, rent, and insurance, and all that great jazz. Um, so I guess what I, what I'm getting at is I, what what I would kind of lean on and kind of just hone back to is the fact that. As a tax assessor collector, if I can be a fiduciary to tax relation citizens and get your taxes lower, because it won't be, it, that, that, and in some cases, it may not be lower, is the thing, but it will be fair. Um, that, that, that would be kind of my approach to that. And that goes back to what you were saying about fairness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And, and I don't know, again, I don't know if I exactly understood the question, but hopefully we yeah. danced around and answered it a little bit. And then there, I think there is one more. Yeah, I, I guess it, it goes to the issue of fairness. Um, yeah. One of the things, like, I'm, we moved here about four years ago from yeah. Illinois, and uh, we purchased a home here. But just on the job, because I, I work for the government, my husband is retired military, um, but I've heard complaints um, about military members who pay no taxes versus and other people feel like their taxes are much higher because there are military families who pay zero tax. And so it, it comes to the issue of fairness, um, not so much that you don't want military to, re I mean, because we get a break on our taxes, but I mean, it just feels like everybody should pay something. Well, <laughs> that's only for 100% disabled. I was going to say, 100% disabled, and, uh, you you won't find me on the stop the stop saying we need to take that away ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure to get that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but no, but but to your point, I, and actually, I'm really uh, Tracy. Thank you so much for that question. I really want to kind of hone back just to just to kind of spar over here a little bit. Um, you are from Illinois, who has a state income tax, and we're completely off base now yeah. from the tax assessor collector's office. But I'm a tax nerd. And I just kind of like that. At about four minutes, sir. Four minutes? Oh, the man. bell's going to ring. The bell's going to ring? Okay. Uh, just <laughs> to like tell, class. <laughs> I know, yeah. T tell us about, you know, kind of, you know, what y'all, did you feel like, okay, with the, the state income tax for Illinois, maybe some of it was untaxed given y'all's uh, military installation. I'm not, I'm not certain with the exact um, tax regime there. But, you know, to my understanding, Illinois, they their, their income tax wasn't, you know, doing much for them over there. But I don't know if you're able to anecdotally speak to that at all. Um, so, having moved here to Texas, we pay property tax as well as income tax. And when I think about the income tax, and because we got a break, my husband's retired military has a disability. So, he, we did get a, a break in our property tax. But our income tax and our property tax together in Illinois is less than what we pay. Incredible. Taxes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was truly yeah. just curious. Yeah. Okay. Very so, well. um, thank you so much. Thank you. And isn't he wonderful? <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for all coming. This has been a really interesting afternoon. And thanks again to. Almost Perk and the Eatons for hosting us. And uh, so, what's next? 
What's next? Oh, oh next. next. I need to pay you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> February 18th is early voting. Please, 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 please um, make sure to announce it on Facebook. Go out and vote. Um, we are, and then we are actually hiring. Um, this is a low ballot, low information race, folks. Um, and this will be one. This this race will be one. No one Googles who their tax, who they want their tax assessment collector to be. It's a low information, low ballot race. And so the strategy and how this election will be won is on the way in. We, we're hiring up 20 uh, station or poll watchers, station leaders, if you will, um, to work essentially eight to ten hours a day. Um, you know, bring two, uh, one to two volunteers with them to be able to hand out you know voting paraphernalia. You know, have a vote Pennington T-shirt on. That way, people know you know who they can vote for and and you know who aligns with what they think on property taxes and the tax assessor collector's office and what the the tax assessor uh, collector's office can do to benefit them on the way into the polls. And so, um, if you're interested in doing that, please uh, talk to one of our campaign managers, Madeline or Andres. Um, and we also have a little text code where you can get involved. I think many of you have already texted it um, because you got this information today. But thank you so much for that question. Yes, Imelda. Does it matter what the children should be able to vote? Uh, oh, great question. Great, 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 great. I owe you some money, too. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, so you can vote anywhere. You can, yeah, the, the, because, of the new, yeah because of the new voting systems and the new voting machines that we have, you can actually vote anywhere. You do not have to go to any specific precinct. Uh, you just show up with, if you already registered your uh, photo ID or your voter registration card, and you can vote anywhere. Uh, I've seen your signs past 1604, yeah. past 410, and then I've seen them going towards. We still got them rolling out. I'm going on a ride on Sunday. It's to, like <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen them either, so that's why we're going on that ride. <laughs> but yeah. I am new here to Bear County. I've been here a well, year and a half, and I transferred my voter registration from Harris County, Houston, Texas to San Antonio. Just and me. I've been utilizing the Bear County website for a lot of information yeah. because I want to try to get familiarized with how the processes of doing different things that I need to take care of for myself here on um, my car and you know and I did find my co my voting code. So I mm -hmm. did go there to vote, mm -hmm. even though it was early voting. I took advantage of it because I wanted to know where I was going. And they do list all the voting poll, early voting polling areas, mm -hmm. but I want to find out where my, based on where I live, my address, where do I need yeah. to go? Right. Right. Exactly. The closest one to you. Oh, but, yeah. but let's say you're at work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you don't have to go to the you don't have to go to that one because of the new voting machines. You can vote any. And I like the, and I like the fact that they're open up, you know, at seven oh, yeah. in the morning. So nice. I yeah, eight to eight to seven that. or something like that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I don't yeah. know if this clientele needs that information. You remember that conversation you and I had about when you go to voting uh, to the to the ballot about the party issue. Hmm. Yes. Do we need to talk about that a little bit? We can. We absolutely can. So uh, what my mom's talking about is there's a lot of. I mean, I'll just. Be very very frank, and and I'm happy I'm happy to let everyone know. You know, there's a lot of people um, who you know they're they're they would not have voted in a primary other than to vote for me. Uh, who who traditionally may find themselves on the Democratic side of the ticket, but because we're in Texas, how we declare is uh, if you want to see my name on the ballot, I'm running as a Republican, and I am a Republican, <laughs> but. You, need, you would need to declare and say, you know, I'm wanting to vote in the Republican Party. And that would exclude you from being able to vote in the Democratic primary in Texas for that cycle. That's how that works. That's how that works. Yes, that's how that but, but, but in general, you can vote. To be eligible to vote in the primary, the deadline is very fast to register. So you, can, so you, you, actually, you actually declare at, at your, your time of voting. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so when you show up to vote, it's kind of like, which ticket do you want? <laughs> and and so that, that point. Because it's just the primary. Yeah, just the primary. And then and so it's kind of like, imagine uh, with the NFL or the NBA, you've got your semifinals where the parties run against each other. And then after that, then it's, that's when you get to see the R versus the D. That happens in November. And I think we are out of time. I really don't. I want to. Uh, Aaron's been so gracious with this. Oh, wow. 
more than gracious with us. Um, and so I don't want to exhaust any more time, but uh, thank you all again so much for coming out. I'll be available outside.